Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to day three of the Global Education Conference. This is our eighth year, kind of hard to believe. Pam and I, we've known each other for about that amount of time, I would guess. I think so, Steve. I think, you know, we've been working together <laughs> that long, yeah. <laughs> Pam Moran and Iris Sokol are here. So delighted to have them here. This is actually our final keynote of the day. Um, we're going to do some quick housekeeping. Special thanks to our sponsors and supporters. Participate, Stalwart, sponsor of the last couple of years. We're so grateful for all the good that they do. Cutter Foundation, first time Say sponsor, okay. Digital Promise, Taking It Global. Taking It Global is our new fiscal agent. A lot of fun there, so we'll enjoy the partnership with them. This is a chance for those of you who are participating live to indicate on the map where you're located. So look to the left of the map, you're looking for the star icon. Click on it twice, then click on the map. And put a note in the chat. We have wonderful volunteer moderators. Maisie is here. Maisie's probably put in as many hours as anybody else during the conference. OK, it looks like Portugal, Israel, Guam, I know we had Poland, South Central Texas, Memphis, keep, keep making notes in the chat, let us know where you are, time and the temperature, woohoo Portugal, <laughs> okay, a lot of fun, okay we're going to turn the time over to Pam and Ira, thank you both for being here. Can't wait to hear this presentation. So it's wonderful to be with you here today. And we are here in a gray and a little overcast central Virginia. And what we want to talk about is liberating learning environments. And we're excited to have a worldwide audience to talk about our work and to hopefully be able to have some response to uh, questions before we finish today. So I, I'm going to turn it over to you because when we think about liberating learning, we can't talk about that without really focusing on how all the areas of curriculum, assessment, pedagogy, tools, and space design come together in order to be able to really liberate learners and learning. Well, and, and Pam, you know, you, you noted earlier this month that it was um, in 2010 that I began coming down to Virginia from Michigan and, and we began working together on a, um, on a really serious basis here. And, and we began thinking about technology, but we quickly learned that we couldn't think about technology without space. We couldn't think about space without thinking about pedagogy. We couldn't think about any of that without thinking about how schools were administrated and operated. And you know, now it's um, we're in year eight of of a collaboration here with with a large group of other people on the ground here, working on the the overall idea of how do we move schools to match the times that our children would be living their lives in. And, you know, Pam has always talked about we live in a time of search, connect, communicate, make. Um, this, is a, this is a significant change from uh, um, the Gutenberg era that, you know, we've, we've left behind. And so schools have to, you know, change radically. And Pam and I were actually just discussing um, at, at breakfast this morning the fact that you can't change, you can't make change go slowly and you can't parcel out change. You need to make change happen in big ways because otherwise it doesn't change and, and nothing happens. Well, and, and one of the things that I really talked about this morning too is that from our observations that change is not a linear process, it's nonlinear. And that we tend to say, well, let's work on curriculum, then let's work on pedagogy, then we'll figure out what assessments we need to do and get it all to line up. But 
that doesn't really work, but because by the time you're working on assessment work, you're really back to having to start on curriculum again. And so my question is always, how do you make this more like gears turning so that you're turning them all at the same time? Yeah, and, and just to touch base here, um, you know, we have links for you. Uh, Pam and I both write on Medium. We're both pretty active on Twitter, um, to say the least. So these are ways you can sort of follow our, our work. We, we want to begin with the idea of zero-based design. And zero-based design is, is saying, uh, at its ultimate belief, it, it's as if we said, we know we want to take children from age four or five to age 18. How do we want to do that? How do we want to do that as a society, as a culture, as educators? How do we want to move children through this? So instead of beginning with looking at schools and wondering how we can ad adapt those, we look at the world and see how we can adapt that to, yeah. to change the spaces. Because what we find is if all you do is to iterate on the traditions that you had, you're always in this very incremental change model. And we believe that for this century that we've got to really almost go back to that Bell Labs example from the 1950s when a vice president walked into a group of uh, engineers with Bell Labs and said, imagine that today the phone system for the United States of America is gone. It has been blown up and it no longer exists. Now build the phone system that we need in this day and age. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to figure out how do we not just build on what we've always been doing, but how do we really go to that sort of ground zero and build the educational system that we need today, not the one we needed yesterday? It, it's, a challenging, it's a challenging mix, but what we've tried to do in our schools is say, what is it our children need? Um, that's always our start. When anybody comes to us and says they want technology or space or um, anything else, we say, what will children be able to do once they have this that they can not do currently? Because that's, that's what matters in, in a big way. So we've tried to listen to students and see the student experience through the eyes of students out of school to understand what it is they need from us so that we can begin to give this to them. And um, zero-based design isn't just about space. It's about the attitudes, the relationships between teachers and children. It's about the technology they get to use. You'll see children in these pictures with lots of computers and things. And uh, just so you know, our, our children are the uh, administrators of their own computers. Uh, we take that risk because we believe there's no better way for children to learn to be um, users. We believe that every child should be able to walk into a room and decide where, how, or if to sit. Um, and you'll see children in lots of different seating poses. Because the basic question we want to ask all the time is, how does the world learn? What is natural learning and what does that look like? How would we know we're on track with that? I really love when you start to see our kids working that we've really tried to emphasize how do people, how do humans learn in a really natural way? And so we've really started really rebuilding the idea of kids working in multi-age spaces, kids working with tools, kids uh, learning from the aspirational peers, uh, through story movement, through um, almost an apprenticeship model, and having our kids see themselves not just as learners but as teachers, so that we have redefined that teachers can learn from our kids in the same way that our kids learn from teachers and with each other. So it's kind of a natural learning community. It, it's, um, we, we believe this happens at, you know, sort of every age level and, um, 
And it, but it all begins with a trust. And I'm going to go back to this slide for a second. If you look toward the, the left in the middle of the picture, you'll see students who are moving into this multi-age classroom. This is 130 students from kindergarten through fifth grade in a large space with six teachers. You'll see students moving in from the outside. They're not moving in from the outside with teachers. They are trusted to go in and out of the building as their learning needs. We create a lot of transparency, so that's okay. Teachers can see the kids outside. In this picture, you see it, uh, this is a middle school environment. This is where we created lots of options for students for physical education. And we have a situation where middle schoolers look forward to phys ed instead of not. But we created um, mixed spaces where the phys ed area merges with the school um, so that people can work together so we're not isolating things. Um, this is a high school where we've created, we've taken out lockers and created commons areas for students to gather, um, including during class, so students can move in and out of the classroom as need be, which leads us to the in and out. The, you know, our second sort of chapter here is, is schools without walls. Um, we really try to refuse to accept unnecessary boundaries. And, and those can be boundaries of a classroom. It can be boundaries of a school uh, in terms of walls. It can be boundaries of a school district, a state, or a nation. That One of the things that we've really talked about is how do we really allow our kids to exist in a world that outside of school is quite permeable and where people move in and out of space, um, and both virtually as well as uh, physical, and how do we make our schools much more like natural learning environments versus these contrived traditional spaces? So when we talk about outside inside, we're not just talking about at the school grounds, but we're talking about beyond. So, you know, whether it's that you can't build a tree house, and we'll talk about that a little later, without uh, going and get a tree in the last slide. Maybe you can't really study um, the landing of uh, Europeans at Jamestown without discussing how shelter is built and without kids experiencing that. Um, maybe you can't really teach math without learning to build things. Um, and this, and this uh, photo actually is one of the ones that challenges people <laughs> more than anyone that we put out there, Ira, because this is an eight-year-old who's making a Jenga game for his, his school, and he's outside using this chop saw. And when I walked up, I said, don't you need somebody older here with you? He said, I don't know why. I'm the expert. And, and we accept that he's the expert. We also know that when people ask us about rules, um, we say that kids are very good at following rules that make sense for them. Um, kids generally don't want to hurt themselves, so they handle power tools with real respect. Kids don't respect rules that don't make sense to them, like don't drink around the computer, which every adult does, and uh, don't eat in the classroom and don't chew gum. Um, let you talk about this briefly. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorite stories. Iowati, who is right at the front um, holding the board, um, when you in the spring went to her teacher uh, in an engineering class and said, you know, I don't think middle school girls really have a good sense that engineering can be fun and also a great career. And so he said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to start a summer camp and bring middle school girls in and work with them. And Iowati at the time here is a 10th grader. She's now out of school and in college. But she put it all together. She recruited friends to help run it. She advertised it, she solicited materials, brought the kids in for what became a bridge building camp, and the kids ended up building bridges and are still continuing to build bridges in areas where we have walking trails in our community, making them more accessible, particularly for people that may be older or have handicapping conditions that would be blocked by not having access to a bridge over a small stream. When I asked Iowati, I said, so what do you think people really learned, the girls learned in your camp? 
She said, well, I think they did learn that engineering is fun, that it's not nearly as challenging as people think it is in terms of the math, that it can be a great hands-on kind of activity. But she said, I also think that they learned that being able to give something back to your community to do social good, that they never thought of engineering as a potential social good career. So here's Iowati and her bridge project. And and the next slide is, you know, this is a freshman natural earth science class um, working on stream stream studies. Um, they built a very complicated Arduino powered monitors to put in streams. We have mountain streams that change dramatically when rain hits. And the kids were interested in, in what that meant in terms of what was going on with pollution and, and agricultural runoff and things. And so they created this and put it in the streams, um, downloaded mammoth amounts of um, data that they could then manipulate, which is phenomenal for math skills. And in fact, worked with an elementary school that was doing a, a lighter weight version of the pro project, and, and they worked together all year. It was, you know, kind of remarkable to watch. But, you know, perhaps, you know, breaking down boundaries begins with saying it's okay to write on the floor if that's the best way to learn. Uh, it's okay to make a mess. The question is, how do you take the limits off learning? How do you see those, and to start with, how do you see those limits in your school and in your classroom? So one of the things that we've also done is to try to figure out how do we really create as many different kinds of spaces as possible where we are taking down walls. And here's an example of a uh, what could have been a gym but became a fitness center for us with our kids um, that in many ways has been shaped by feedback from children as well as the educators who say, when you graduate from high school, who goes to play basketball in a gym very often as compared to people that go to try to find places where they can work out and maintain fitness and wellness? And I think this is really reflective of the fact that one of the things that drives our work are our lifelong learning competencies and our seven pathways, that when we say what we want in our graduates, we're looking for fitness and wellness and the ability to create and problem solve and find solutions and do all kinds of things that really build knowledge in ways that um, start with the children's interest. And that's as true for our high school kids as it is our elementary or middle school. Go back to the bees. That's kind of a fun one. The, the bees, though, is a great slide because I remember that one of our learning technology integrators who was working um, with this class to, you know, that wanted to study bees and build a beehive, and he said, well, is it okay I just bought 20,000 bees? And I said, what could go wrong with that? And uh, he, he said, don't worry, they're calm Italian bees. I said, well, all right, I guess I'll have to accept that. But, you know, they, you know this class is weighing um, the hives. They can track the weather by weighing the hives. They can track things. They've already produced honey. So. Oh my gosh, they, they, they are entrepreneurs and scientists and technologists uh, and even uh, sociologists all rolled into one. But um, one of the things I also think this slide illustrates along with others is that we've really tried to build a culture of getting to yes. So when a teacher has an idea or a child has an idea and they come to us and say we want to do this, Rather than starting with a yeah, but, or nah, we already tried that, or that's too dangerous, we start out with, yeah, let's, let's think about how we can make this work. And so the bees are an example, tree houses in the cafeteria are an example, our tiny house is an example that our kids built this last year. And, and you know, and this all becomes, when Pam talks about this, this is the start of the, the question that we think all school uh, systems schools and school systems need to know your beliefs and and because we work to be clear and consistent in our messaging because that's that's really important so we start with and i'll let pam think about this but we call our common care our lifelong learning competencies this is the one goal we have as a school system is that our students will graduate with these 
competencies. Absolutely. And we started with a project that we like to say that Albemarle was doing design before the rest of the world sort of embraced design, at least in the education world, in 2002 with a project called Design 2004. And our teachers came back to us after developing units and working with kids in really very interesting project work, um, PBL before there was maybe PBL in the way we think of it today, and said, we need to make sure we don't lose this. And so what came from that work in 2002 was what we call our lifelong learning competencies. And here they are. You can find them on our website. In fact, I'll put the link up here in a minute. Um, but these are the things that we say, this is what our outcomes are for learning in Albemarle, not kids learning to do what they need to do to pass a test, but learning for life. And, and the critical nature of that is what drove us in the next iteration which is, um, was called Design 2015, which was in 2012. And we asked schools to present ideas to break through blocks, things that were blocking them from changing learning dramatically. And when we looked at those, we found seven different paths that people were um, looking to follow. And this became our seven pathways, which we describe as both our commitments to our own professional development, but promises to our students as well. And we, so we talked about a maker-infused curriculum. We believe that students need to have ownership of, of the context of their learning, that they should design that, and then it's our job to put the content into that. We talk about interactive technologies, if technology isn't an interactive thing, we might as well be using worksheets, and we don't want that. Um, we talk about universal design for learning, which is, uh, you know, an essential part of thing. Every student needs to have their paths open to them. Um, project problem and passion-based learning, and we sort of see that as a continuum. Projects are still often teacher-generated. Problems are often teacher generated, but passions are student based learning. Um, we talk about continuous connectivity, that our kids need to be linked to the world. And choice and comfort is a dominant thing for our, for our schools. Kids need to be comfortable, and I think you can see that in the pictures. And then instructional tolerance, teachers understanding that it's not their school. It's the student school, and we need to create a, a learning community that works for everyone. And I would just focus on that. When we started talking about the concept of project-based learning, and then somebody said, well, you know, we can't just limit it to project. We need to think about kids taking on big challenges or problems. And then somebody said, yeah, but it's really about the P. It's really about passion. So that's where the term P-based learning came from, which is about Kids working on big problems, uh, going through projects that are really of interest to them, and really being able to bring their passion to the work they do. Um, so we ask you to think about what's important in your school, and do your rules and norms support the things that matter, or do they support sort of compliance-based um, things? And, and what because if you know, we always think this, if our desired user experience is what we, student choice, student centered and opportunity focused, um, what is our user interface? How are our schools built? How does our technology work, uh, et cetera? So, you know, we start, for instance, with technology is we always have at least three ways for students to do anything on their computers. Um, we just believe that's, that's the route to things so students can learn to make their own decisions. We have creative software as one of the things we choose to pay for, um, although we use lots of freeware and shareware. We have a large accessibility suite on our computers that any student gets to use any time because that's universal design for learning. They don't need a diagnosis to use text-to-speech or speech-to-text. If that's what works for them, they get to use it. If virtual reality works for them, 
that's great. If drones give them a, an entry into education, that works. Uh, I'll just touch quickly on our technology design because we're one to one, three through twelve, plus we're BYOD. Um, we we want the world in our in our schools. Um, we have student control of our computers. Um, we use Windows laptops because they have the most uh, student options and the most available free solutions and we're trying to prep kids for life after school. Um, we have full accessibility on every laptop as I as I described. We're, and then we have our future goals which you know we're really pushing hard for um, experimenting with things. How is the world learning to learn? And so we're looking at more powerful and touchscreen laptops. We want virtual reality in our mainstream of content delivery. Um, and we're trying to, we're in the process of trying to provide, you know, wireless broadband to students wherever they live because 70% of our land area has no broad, broadband possibility whatsoever. Um, and we're working on, you know, more plans for solutions as we go forward. We are, we always think of things, and I'll let Pam take through this, through a design yeah. structure that moves us. As a, as a school superintendent, one of the things that I was handed when I moved into my office was the uh, three ring binder that was probably four inches thick with the strategic plan in it, which had a, a liberal dusting of dust all over it. And I realized at that time that oftentimes we let strategic plans get in the way of good ideas. And so what we've really done is to make a planning process that certainly is strategic in nature, but part of that strategy is also having our teachers, our kids, our parents, our uh, principals, any of the folks that work in the system think about what are the ideas that might help us to invent up solutions to challenges that we have. Right now we've got an entire community that's been helping us build a new solution to educating high school age teens um, without building a fourth traditional high school. Um, what we're looking at is something that is incredibly innovative and it came from invention thinking. People who were curious about how do we really come up with new ideas that we want to test, rapid prototype, and then move into practice. Once people come up with inventive ideas though, Ira, oftentimes somebody else will pick it up and they'll iterate it. They'll figure out how to maybe change it a little bit, turn it into something else, and then that becomes something that, that potentially starts to spread across the system. It's more scaling across than up. And once it looks like this is something that's really making a difference for us, we'll move it into our systems thinking strategic focus. And eventually, if it becomes something that is so impactful and really making a difference in the work we do, it'll just become operational and then we just nurture it, but we don't have to feed it like we did when it was in an invention bucket. So when we look at things, our one-to-one -one was invention in 2010. Um, it was an experiment in one grade and one middle school, uh, but now it's fully operational. Um, it's expected. It's what we do. Um, we're, we're working on eliminating elementary age-based grades. That was invention a few years ago, and now it's strategic. We're working to put it into more and more of our elementary schools. Um, virtual reality is now invention. A couple of people saying, what can we do with this? So we're watching it and seeing what's going on. Our, but our high school redesign is innovation. Um, this is something we're, we're working our way to. And we have what are changing, replacing middle school classrooms with multi-interdisciplinary learning labs is um, you know, is strategic. This is this is work across the system. I always am an ultimate fan of this picture. It captures risk um, and possibility, and you know, 
not laughing because a student chooses to measure six feet in the air instead of, um, oh, but one of the things we've done is, is so we can, we know what we're doing is we have design imperatives that, that we firmly believe in. So when we work with architects or designers or think about spaces or schools, you know, we can say that we have a list of expectations for every space we create now or, or recreate. And um, I think that one of the things that uh, Gordon Dalby has just put up some questions about how flexible are we with teacher contracts, um, how flexible are we with transportation. And one of the things I think about, Ira, is that we are not just trying to build flexibility into every area of the work that our young people do and that our teachers are able to do in terms of working with them. For example, like the bees, you can't have hives of bees without kids taking care of the bees all summer so long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we have to really think about that. But one of the things that Iris done that I think is really uh, has been pretty impactful in terms of sort of year-round thinking about school and professional learning together is the Coder Dojo model. I don't know if you could talk about that a minute because I think it illustrates a lot of the que what, what uh, uh, Gordon's asking about. Because as we're trying to get to, you know, the breakthrough and, and I'll talk about it as we get into this next group, um, is to change how uh, our professionals see their role and they don't see it as a 10 month um, simple thing that operates, you know, just through these specific hours on these specific days. Uh, and, and because we want our teachers to be, as it says here, pedagogical entrepreneurs. We want them to be constantly inventing and developing. This is our, one of our high school librarians here um, cooking in the library. It's, um, and it's that kind of importance, but it's the always get to yes. So one of the things we began about six years ago now is, is Coder Dojo. It's a program we brought in from Ireland and a sort of peer-to-peer -peer mentored um, coding camps, but we use it a number of ways. So this goes on in the summer. Um, it's not only a great activity for kids, it's this phenomenal activity for teachers. Teachers come to us and for their summer professional learning requirements, they spend a week or two weeks with us, uh, you know, working in this incredible multi-age, it's K through 12, um, all day long, uh, project-based, interdisciplinary, um, you know, environment. And so they get to learn this in a big way. You know, and it's, it's become our, one of our primary drivers of change with professional learning because as teachers graduate and prove their use of thus, these skills in the classroom, they then come back as expert teachers and work, work with others. As we work through our high school 2022 project. And I just put links up, by the way. Right. We're, you know, we're thinking, okay, what if a teacher wants to offer their class for three hours on a Saturday instead of other times? Our kids want to come in at 12 and work till 7. Right. You know, what, whatever, why would we stop that? Um, it's like we're trying to rebuild our, our bus system into a transit system that connects kids when they need to move to internships. And it's all part of, you know, the getting to yes that Pam referred to earlier. And I'll let her take you through. We were just talking today about how to give kids um, cards with uh, Uber cards. the capability to move independently across right. the system and not be even dependent on our bus right. schedules. But I think that the other thing is that um, that as a philosophy, the getting to yes piece is absolutely critical to the work we do because what we've tried to do is to open the door to create almost a renaissance of ideas um, and cultural intersections in the work we do. And the way we do that is when somebody does have an idea and we say, yeah, let's do that, we also realize that collaborative culture is what gets you to a sense of collectively making a difference. And so one of the first questions we'll ask is, who else needs to be on the team with you? Who else in the community can join with you 
to help make this idea real. Then we also have to, like every other place in the education where money is a challenge, is to ask the question, how do we leverage resources, the L and Yelp, for us, so that we sometimes have to redirect funds from things that we need to stop doing to things that we want to start doing. And then lastly, rather than trying to make a change that is going to impact everybody, whether people are ready or not, we say let's start by prototyping and giving people who are willing to take risks, who are the explorers on the edge of uh, the work that we're doing, an opportunity to kind of refine it, revise it, to almost take it through writing process, an, an idea to get it right, and then start to share it out with others. For me, that's how you build a substrate of creativity, that if you think about it through a science metaphor in terms of petri dishes, that if you want to grow and make something go viral, you have to start in one space and let it grow out from that. You know, and, and some of the ways we do this, so, you know, as we just finished through a slide of, you know, a kid throwing a pitch, he was throwing a pitch through his own invention, which is uh, a laser uh, screen that tells a pitcher whether they're throwing balls or strikes. Um, and this was created by a seventh grader. Um, uh, you know, and things that go on. Can, can baseball teach these things? Can cooking teach history and math? Oh, we know it can. Can rap music teach physics and reading and writing and biology for that matter? We have all these examples of what it can. So, you know, the get to yes is really important as a, as a skill level. Um, can middle school kids handle very complex software as well as complex schools? Of course they can. Can kids be trusted? Of course they can if you set up the right things. This is a seventh grade language arts classroom. And you'll see the kids find their ways to make themselves comfortable, which is a vital skill, you know, in this day and age. So Can go back to that for just okay. a second. Because I also think about that, you know, our kids when they're using technology, Ira, that while our our tech is one to one. When you start to look around the room, you realize that some kids are working more individually, some mm -hmm. kids are working in what you might call more of a one to two or one to three, yeah. <laughs> and so that, that we don't want our technology to isolate kids from each other, but to let them be able to make the choices they need to make to do the work they need to do in the moment. And sometimes that's collaboratively around a screen, not just individually. It's very true, you know, kids will learn to work together in things that look very much like what you'll see in any office these days. So, you know, one of the ways we encourage this, Dale Doherty of Make, Make Magazine um, was here a couple of years ago and he said, you are what you celebrate. So we tell our story everywhere and we honor those who do the work. Um, this is, you know, really critical that kind of images that Pam and I put up on Twitter are not just designed to tell you in the world about this, they're designed to honor the work that's being done across the board. Um, you know, and we, so we celebrate comfort. We celebrate creativity. We use Twitter, we use the web, our, you know, our website is constantly showing great student work. We have teachers who are very active on Instagram. Um, we use Facebook. We use YouTube. We're going to get to Snapchat somehow because everybody uses it. And the fact is, you can't you can't argue with what everyone does. And since every teen uses that, we're sort of in in you know a, a key place with that. Uh, but, you know, so when a student makes the brilliant thought that they can fold down a window and use it as a writing pad or prove that they can use two devices at once, let's, let's celebrate it. Yeah, we just say let the kids roll and what they will create just absolutely blows us away. In fact, one of the things that I think is probably the, the next generation of work we're doing with High School 2022, although we've even got 
elementary kids doing this is how do kids start to create curriculum? How do kids create uh, work that they want to teach other kids? We see that um, in the work that, that Julian's done with drones. Mm -hmm. I saw that he's teaching aviation classes in John Barber's classroom yeah. this week. And uh, even watching fifth graders develop a curriculum and sign people up for classes. Watching, watching fifth graders develop a drone pilot class and, and teaching kids how to do it and actually see the incredible videography that comes out of that is just this absolutely remarkable thing to see. Um, but, you know, one of the things we always want to show is that the, the ordinary rules that make school boring for kids is, you know, need not apply. And we want to say that over and over again. So showing kids seriously working despite sitting in lots of different ways, um, you know, is, a, is really important. And uh, you'll see writing on the floor as a basic, you know, part of our lives here. Um, it's, it's what we do. Um, the uh, and you'll see some of the kind of spaces we're creating now. This is part of a, a middle school learning lab where we have different sized rooms and lots of transparency. Um, so we wanted to end here before we'll get to questions and stuff with who we are. Um, we're the Albemarle County Public Schools. Um, we're at the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. We surround the city of Charlottesville, which has had its notoriety of, of late. Um, and, and we have challenges that relate to that. Uh, we, we're unusual in the U.S. in terms of eastern U.S., certainly in terms of size. We have 726 square miles. We start with an urban core and we go to mountain rural. Um, we have massive income inequality, which is a continuous challenge for us. Um, we have about 14,000 students with 25 schools in 24 buildings. Our buses put on 15,000 miles every day. Um, and as I said, 70% of our area has no broadband. So we think of ourselves as a true test bed. We have, we have we can show what we do in urban environments and suburban environments and rural environments where a median-sized school system with median funding in terms of the United States. Uh, I'm going to make Pam um, uh, answer more of the questions because <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. But this is, this is part of the Treehouse Project we've, we've alluded to. So this was a middle school. Uh, where kids wanted to redo their cafeteria, a windowless, really sort of soulless place. And we brought in an architect who was used to working with kids in iterative design. No plans drawn, no, um, you know, no... This uh, is kind of our work. signature story. It's our <laughs> signature story. Um, the kids decided, Pam thought they were going to build uh, booths. Dining booths. The principal said, <laughs> we want to do, we want to redesign the cafeteria into a dining experience. I'm thinking booths, few plants, maybe some uh, posters on the wall. I start to see these pictures going up on Instagram and Twitter and immediately call Ira and the principal and say, what are you doing <laughs> down there? And well, the kids decided they wanted to build tree houses. Yeah, and Ira says, yeah, not just tree houses, rolling tree houses. So I hop in my car and go down there, you know, because superintendents do worry a little bit about these things called liability, and there are some limits. I was said, I said, Ira, well, maybe eight feet up. And I said, maybe 12, and then she went down there and said, they're 18 feet in the air. And I said, you yeah. went to the top of the cafeteria. Right, but nobody's fallen yet, you know, and... and we're good with that. There was more math and language learning during these two weeks. Math teacher looked at me and said, there are kids up here. Principal said, kids up here who spend a lot of time in the office, um, not always for the best reasons. Uh, teacher said, these kids have learned more math. They're learning math that I would have never anticipated they could learn in seventh grade. 
Uh, Alex Gilliam from Public Workshop, who you should definitely follow on Twitter, goes all over the country and works with uh, kids and communities to help create structures that do social good, worked with these kids. And he said, these kids are fabulous, and look what they're creating right here on the spot. I mean, it just they just built it. I'll just tell you that this was at the end of day two. Um, they were already at this point, and then every day they take apart what they didn't think worked and put it back together. And their end result was some of the more remarkably crafted furniture you'll ever see in schools. I did, I did go to the lawyer and say, I don't want to tell these kids I have to take this down, but what do I need to do? And he said, being somebody who understands, we also try to get to yes, even with our lawyers. He said, you got to get it inspected. If there are things you need to change, change it and make sure that the kids are taught how to use this safely and let it go. This was three years, three years ago, four no. years ago. Yeah, and the, the, we did an inspection. Um, there were three or four changes, like, you know, railings and stuff mm -hmm. that had to be. What about that sign? That, and my favorite sign is at a point where if you stepped off, you drop eight feet. The kids have solved the safety issue by putting up a sign that says, not the way down, um, which is very true. There have been no accidents on it. The kids made the rules of how to use it, including um, that you don't climb with either your lunch tray or your laptop. You go up and then um, someone passes to you. There's even a space in it for kids who use wheelchairs. Um, so the kids were very sensitive to their whole population. Um, you know, but this is another quick uh, we're, we're almost at 10, right, ending so. story. So mm -hmm. this is a kindergarten classroom, and the, this kindergarten teacher, um, said, people say, aren't you nervous the kids are up on this ledge, especially in a rocking chair? And she said, well, I said to them, you know, if you fall off this, it's going to hurt. So, she said, I'd advise you to be careful when you're up here. And she said, so the kids are rocking chair police, all of them. They'll say, you're rocking too fast. It's moving. You know, be careful. That's how we teach care for each other without limiting our, what our kids get to do. So, um, it, it's, you know, it's a powerful thing that stretches all the way. And, I want to end with one of my favorite quote from one of my favorite education writers, William Alcott, of that famous family who was a teacher and Writer. one of America's earliest writers about education, about public education. Um, and he wrote in 1832 that we too often consult our own convenience rather than the comfort, welfare, or accommodation of our children. Um, it's a lot of years have gone by since he, he wrote that, and unfortunately, it's still true. Um, and that's the way to begin change: is what it, what's the comfort, welfare, and accommodation of our children? So um, I'd like Pam to talk through some of the questions that have been asked, or Steve. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see. Uh, my my I'm screen here. is kind of. So funny. I'm I'm gonna help you really guys. Uh, look okay. Yeah, help us out Thanks. here, Lucy. Thank you. I have a question for you, Pam, and maybe this is. Um, I think everybody's incredibly inspired, and the comments have been wonderful. And as Becky Peters said, we can stay here all day. But here's my question for you. Um, I know a little. You know, a word on the street has it that you're retiring, Pam. What's going to happen in Albemarle once you? Um, move on to your next thing, how do you sustain this change? <laughs> and I, I know it's a difficult question. Well, you probably yeah. don't want to talk about it now. Sure. But I'm like, I, I, was, I, it, I think um, leaders like you are, are one of a kind. And how are they going to, what, what's going to be the follow-up back to you is my question, I guess. Is Ira going to be around still, mm -hmm. or what's the story? Yeah, that's his plan. Um, the thing that, that the thing that I think is most critical that I learned from a mentor very early in life is that it is the collective that really leads an organization well, not any one person that is tagged with positional power. And so over the years that I've worked as a leader, both in schools, as principal, as well as uh, at other district positions and then here in superintendency, 
is that I've seen over and over again in other places where one person kind of owns the work and when they walk away because it's maybe been kind of a compliance driven world, people will revert back to wherever it is that they feel they need to be. It's been my intention to build the capacity of any group that I work with, whether it's uh, the school system or if I'm pulled into an organization outside the system, to try to really go after having people feel that sense of power and authority and importance of their voice, their influence, and their own agency so that they own the work, not just see it as residing in the superintendent's office. In fact, you know, one of the things that I think about is that if um, ideas only flowed out of the door of my office, which I don't stay in very often, then we really haven't built the organization that um, is going to withstand the test of time. I see when I look around the system incredible young leaders who are ready to take over uh, the, the roles of people who look like me. Um, I see a senior team, including Matt Hawes, who's deputy superintendent that is um, going to be the next superintendent, as having absolutely the vision, mission, and sense of, of uh, efficacy to continue this work. I think the board's vote of confidence in him was that two minutes after I announced my uh, retirement, they appointed him as superintendent because they so value the continuation of the work. So for me, I think one of the lessons learned over a long number of decades um, in education is that when leaders actually don't see themselves as owning the organization from a positional power perspective and they spend a lot of time building out the capacity for everybody to see themselves as leaders, kids, teachers, parents, central staff, what you end up with is an organization that when I walk away, I expect to come back in five years and find this to be an organization that's even better than it is today and even more progressive than when I walk out the door. So I'd like to think that if I've done my job well, that the group of people that are here and people that they will bring in will continue this work because I believe that it is the right work on behalf of children in this century, and I'm not the only person in the system that thinks that way. Ira, you want to comment? Well, I'm, I'm just uh, starting the campaign for our new governor to make you Secretary of Education here Thank in Virginia. You, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get to spread further. I, you know, I think one of the things that all of us in leadership here are constantly doing is is trying to empower the next the next generation of leaders. Just this afternoon, I had um, um, someone who works with me who is not quite forty, you know, and he was at. I asked him to come to a to a budget meeting with me, and he said, "Do I really belong there?" And I said, "You have to belong there." I can't be the only person who knows this. We need we we need to empower you know, every group as we go along. Whenever we find, you know, young people who are who have the leadership potential, we encourage and support their move towards administration. We um, um, we try to bring them along in in really powerful ways to do things. Um, and just so you know, Pam's successor is is the leader of the, uh, the has been the lead on our high school 2022 concept, and the first person who said he didn't want to think of this as high schools anymore, but he wanted to think of ourselves as 726 square mile, 4,500 student high school, yep. where students that have real choices. That the whole community is the high right, school. Right, the whole community is the high school. So we're, um, I, I think we're good with the future. There's only one Pam. Um, I'm here because of her. But, you know, the trick is the next people will will lead in different ways, but we continue to march forward. I have no fears about that. We have one more question from Becky Peters, who happens to be from 
St. Brain Valley in Boulder. She just reached out to me, and St. Brain has been making a lot of progress in their innovations over the last couple of years. And she's asking you, what is pushing your thinking right now? This will be our last question. What is pushing your thinking oh, right now? What are you learning or reading? Um, and she wants to be more like you when she grows up. So, um, <laughs> so uh, what, what, what are your inspirations? Oh, gosh, you know, um, I, I'm really intrigued with, the kids put me into a VR experience recently, and I was in um, the Great Barrier Reef, and all I could think is what an amazing experience this is. Wouldn't it be cool if there were five more people in here with me? Okay. So I'm really intrigued with how new technologies as tools um, interface with community to allow kids to have experiences that otherwise they would never have, but also how they're able to create inside that. When I watched that young girl build that dress as a designer yeah. inside VR, yeah. and everybody in the room was watching her swoop and move more like she was in a ballet than doing something in VR, it was just an amazing experience. But I think that I keep looking out at the, the edges of How's the world changing? And I see, um, I see the idea of cultural integration as being another area of focus for us um, in terms of how do we, how do we create that sort of a um, Medici effect in which by bringing together people from such diverse cultures, whether it's at the teacher level, the kid level, the community level, that we start to build a kind of curriculum that's more co-created versus driven by that sort of the old standardization movement. Well, and, you know, I guess one of the things that's pushing me right now is in a big way is, um, and, and, you know, not, not to dismiss virtual reality, because I think virtual reality and augmented reality are vast changes in, in how the world learns. We had a group of students and teachers go down to Virginia Tech and, and be part of a physics class that was watching um, the super collider collisions in, in virtual reality and thinking, you know, wow, is the power of this. But, you know, we, uh, my team has been throwing the thing of starting a, a sort of mini high school center by next fall, one that will be sort of tech focused and um, um, will allow, sort of demonstrate a bunch of our new high school theories. And, you know, we're talking about everything from asking, start offering startup space in this in exchange for having our kids be tech interns with them, um, to how they will interact with the community, to how we will challenge them to solve the community problems because at some point we have to combine um, the technology that exists that is available to us now with the societal needs that are available to us now. I mean, one of the things we we learned up, up close and personal in Charlottesville this summer was, you know, was to me the failure of our education system. Um, that runs all the way up through our, our nation. Um, we have to do better at what we do. We have to build better empathy structures. We have to um, encourage kids to be community problem solvers. We, we have, you know, lots of work to do. And so to me, the challenge is how do we bring this together? you know, in a coherent yeah, it, way. It was an incredible challenge for us because as we were starting school, you know, we had kids that had seen images of their own hometown. And that's one of the things I think that really hit me as a superintendent in Albemarle because the Charlottesville city is embedded in the county of Albemarle is that our children frequent the streets, the parks, the um, areas in which um, these events that happened in Charlottesville on August 12th occurred. And I all of a sudden realized that the kids weren't looking at some distant city where something had happened that was pretty horrific, but they were looking at streets they know well. And so it struck me that we had to go back and rebuild our entire start of school. We rebuilt professional development. Um, 
for teachers, we rebuilt the way our principals started the first day back with teachers. And then how did we have our kids come back and not be immersed in the negative side of what had happened, but to figure out how do you take an event like that and turn it into something where it can be a learning experience that actually empowers our student communities. And what we saw is that we've had kids come forward with all kinds of projects. We mm -hmm. had a lot of kids involved in, in uh, Kindness Day right. recently who are doing things that are bridging um, cultural divides. People doing a lot of introspective reflection about what do we do that creates environments where these kinds of things can happen? And how do we, as educators, reflect on who we are, our own biases, our own filters, and maybe question ourselves even more deeply than we usually think we do? And with that, we'll sort of call it a day and turn it back over to you, Lucy. Uh, Thanks perfect. for listening, everyone. Perfect, Edwin. <laughs> and thank you so much. Talk about professional generosity. You two exemplify it. And I think you've been an inspiration to everyone in this room. Um, uh, attendees, you have their contact information in slides. If you want to save them, you can go to File and Save As in the menu. You can also save the chat file and Save As. And um, I know the, I think Pam also put her contact information in the chat as well. Um, we will be following your work wherever you go, both of you. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.